Welcome to the Manchester Terrier Health Testing Basics for Breeders seminar presented today by me, Michelle Barlack. I hope that this presentation can serve as a useful guide to new, aspiring, and experienced breeders alike. A little about me, my name is Michelle Barlack and I have been involved in the breed for most of my life. Um, I have been an AMTC member for 21 years and I have been the health chair for the past 11 years and the rescue chair for nine years. I also serve as an AKC delegate for the Abethan Hound Club of the United States. I have a bachelor's degree in communications with a focus on public relations, and I currently work for a national nonprofit that breeds, raises, and trains guide dogs for people who are blind and visually impaired. And some past health projects that I have been involved with uh, to benefit the breed are the Juvenile Dilated Cardiomyopathy Study, past breed health surveys, a dentition survey, OFA health testing, and the Breed Archive Pedigree Database. Today we will cover health testing basics and recommendations. This will be the majority of the presentation today and we will close with a little bit about health research. So we can't talk about health testing without first talking about the OFA and their CHIC program. So the Orthopedic Foundation for Animals um, is a health registry that verifies health testing and in some cases performs evaluations. It began as a hip evaluation, so that is why it's called the Orthopedic Foundation for Animals, and it later expanded to include all different kinds of health testing that breeders may use to improve the health of their lines. Later, they developed the CHIC database, which stands for Canine Health Information Center. This database was created as a tool for breeders, pet owners, and researchers alike. It standardized health tests for each breed or variety within a breed, and these tests are chosen by each parent club's board. Now, in the case of the Manchester Terrier Club, the membership also had a say in this. These tests can and should be changed as the needs of the breed evolve. This is very important. We'll talk more about this later. Chick numbers are assigned to dogs who undergo required health screens. So if your dog has completed all of the tests that are required for your breed to obtain a chick number, you'll, your dog will be assigned that number automatically. It will be printed on your AKC registration certificate, so it will be sent to AKC. If you reprint a certificate for your dog or if you have a litter out of that dog, that chick number will appear on those puppies' parents' information. Now you are required to identify each dog permanently with a microchip or tattoo so that identity can be confirmed. And although chick numbers mean the tests were performed, it does not necessarily mean that the tests were passed. So that's important to remember. You shouldn't just see, it, see that a dog has a chick number. You should look up the test results as well. Um, these test results are published in a public database to aid breeders and owners. Um, but they will only publish failing results if the owner has permission. So when you fill out the form to submit your test results to OFA, you can check a box that says only publish passing results. Um, you must, that's another important thing, you must submit the proper paperwork and fees in order for your health testing to appear in the OFA database. And you don't have to do the full series of chick tests to have your dog's health information listed in the database. So for breeders, this is a reliable source of information regarding dogs they may may use in their breeding programs. Um, and you can use it to analyze the pedigrees of proposed breeding dogs for health strengths and weaknesses, as well as the traditional analysis of confirmation that you would do or type and performance strengths and weaknesses. Um, 
And for researchers, this provides confidential and accurate aggregate information for multiple generations of dogs. So um, DNA can be provided to the OFA for use in research, um, but just the t statistics themselves can also be useful. And the last thing I want to say is that we need to approach health testing less like a gotcha or a whodunit, and we need to look at this as these health problems can only be solved with teamwork. So we don't help each other by sweeping health issues under the rug and hiding them. That is very important and nobody should be ostracized for producing a health issue. We should be encouraging each other to report them. You can also report your dog's health information and status in the Breed Archive, which is another project that you can find more out about through our Breeder Mentor Facebook group. Now this is an example of a chick profile. Uh, this dog has had a good number of testing done, so it's a great example of what your results will look like. So you can see not only what tests have been done, you can see the test date, the date that those results were reported to OFA, the age of the dog at the time of testing, the results of the testing, and if the dog has an OFA number for those test results. Um, this is an example if, of dentition, so a dentition dentition numbers were submitted for this dog. And you can also see if parents are in the database, offspring, full and half siblings are in the database. Um, so this doesn't mean that there are no, seeing a dog on this page is great, but it doesn't mean that there aren't health tested dogs elsewhere in the pedigree. Um, And just, okay, and, and another thing I want to say is um, just because a breeder is not submitting health test results to the OFA doesn't mean that the breeder is not health testing. So if a breeder claims that they are health testing and you are interested in getting a dog from them or using one of their dogs in your breeding program, it is very important to ask for proof of that testing. What tests have they done? Can they show you the paperwork? So that you have the peace of mind of knowing not only what those tests were, but in your future breeding programs, you will have that paperwork and back up in your pedigrees to show to interested buyers. What are the required health tests in Manchester Terriers? Prior to 2020, the health tests were the same for both varieties. And these health tests were chosen by a small committee who believed that these were the only diseases that were known to affect both varieties simultaneously. And they selected VWD, von Willebrand's disease, a SURF eye exam, and autoimmune thyroiditis. Those were the three tests that you would do. You would submit your results and you could get a chick number for your dog. These tests were updated in 2020 and there were several reasons for that. AMTC members were asking for them to be updated because there are more tests available now than there were when these, were, these three tests were selected. We now know that legs perthes, patellar luxation, cardiac disease, and deafness can also be found in both varieties. And while it may not be at the same frequency due to the common practice of keeping the gene pool separate for each variety, in many cases, they still occur in both varieties. We've also had the development of genetic testing for cardio and xanthinuria that did not exist prior. And it was noted that pet people were obtaining dogs to breed and completely unaware that they needed to test for JDCM and xanthinuria, two diseases which can be fatal. Um, xanthinuria is not always fatal, but JDCM, if a dog has two copies of the gene, is always fatal. And breeders thought, well, we'll look at the OFA required tests and do those tests, and then we're good to go. But that's that we know that now that that is not the case. 
Um, and Chick also, this is a, another reason, began to allow breeds to differentiate health testing by variety. For example, poodles have three varieties. They are similar to Manchester's and that they are occasionally interbred and they have different a different frequency of health issues that show up within those three varieties for the same reason. So looking at that model, we approached OFA and asked them if they would allow us to separate them. This is a question we've asked in the past and we were told no, but this time we were told yes. Here we have the current list of OFA tests for each variety. These are the tests that are recommended by the parent club for Manchester Terriers. These were decided based on a poll that was done in 2020 of Manchester Terrier breeders where they were asked to select the diseases that they felt were most prevalent in each variety and rank them in order of importance. Now you'll note the list is nearly the same for both varieties. The primary difference is the priority that is given to some of the tests on this list. The required tests for chick are bold and the recommended tests are in blue. We now know that all of these diseases could potentially affect both varieties. However, the prevalence of the diseases varies. It's important to select the test that best fits your breeding program. Of course, there is no harm in doing all of these tests. But if you are in a position where you need to prioritize, prioritize the testing, then you need to think about what are the things that you feel the dogs in your breeding program based on past knowledge, past testing, past history that your dogs may be at risk for. When you register your test results with OFA, you will have to state whether your dog is a standard or a toy variety. That will determine when your dog gets their chick number. Now, if you have a pedigree that you are working with that is a standard pedigree, but the dog that you are testing weighs less than 12 pounds and you've been showing it as a toy, or if you have a primarily toy pedigree, but your dog weighs more than 12 pounds and you've been showing it as a standard, what I would do is I would report the dog's variety based on its pedigree and I would do the required test for that variety. Now there are two kinds of tests that you can do or that are included in this database. There's a phenotypic evaluation, and then there's a genetic test. The, important, the differences here are important because it determines whether or not this testing will need to be repeated at any point in time. A phenotypic evaluation is what the dog appears to be at the time of the testing. It is either a physical exam by a veterinarian or it is a blood test. It is used in the absence of a genetic marker. An evaluation of whether the dog in question appears to be affected by a disease at the time of the exam or blood draw. So this is important. Just because your dog is not affected by a disease at this point in time may not mean that it couldn't be affected by the disease at a later time. Obviously a genetic marker that is an absolute indication of whether or not the dog will ever have the disease is the best, that's the gold standard, but in many cases, a genetic marker isn't available. We haven't been able to do the research or the research has not progressed far enough yet. So this aids in determining risk factors for a breeding. It's not going to always be definitive, but over time, research has shown that it does help to reduce the incidence of disease. Now a genetic test tells you what the dog is. This is an examination of the dog's DNA. Most often this is a cheek swab, but you can also extract DNA from a blood sample, from a tissue sample, depending on the situation. It can aid in diagnosing a disease that may or may not be clinical at the time of DNA collection. And it can determine risk factors for breeding, selection of mates, and the risk to the offspring. 
So we will get more into the different types of phenotypic and genetic tests that are available through the OFA program. Next, we're going to talk about the genetic screens or the genetic tests. There's three of them that are available in our breed. And you'll notice I go through this presentation that where a test that we're describing is required by a variety for a variety by OFA to obtain a chick number, that variety is noted in an abbreviation in parentheses. So for example, juvenile dilated cardiomyopathy and xanthinuria are both required tests for the toy variety in order to obtain an OFA chick number. And again, that does not mean that you should not test your standards for this, and we will go through that with each test. A genetic screen is a cheek swab most often. It is collected by the owner and shipped to a genetics lab. You can also use tissue or blood if needed, but the cheek swab is the simplest way to do this. There is no minimum age required by OFA for this test to qualify as a chick, recommend, as a chick recognized test. However, it is recommended that this test be done post weaning if you are using the oral cheek swabs. There is no recommendation for re-examination at a later date because these genetic screens are definitive. So the first two genetic screens we're going to talk about are juvenile dilated cardiomyopathy, often abbreviated as JDCM, and xanthinuria. JDCM is a heart disease that causes sudden death in puppies by six months of age, but it can occur up to five years of age. However, most puppies that we see with this disease will pass before their first birthday. JDCM can only be diagnosed with a genetic test or a post-mortem necropsy. This is important. There is no physical exam that can screen your dogs for JDCM. You cannot take your living dog to any vet in the world and ask them if your dog has JDCM. You cannot hear it with a stethoscope. You cannot see it on an echocardiogram or an EKG. You have to do the genetic test. This is not to date been loaded, noted in standard lines, but standard owners are encouraged to test, particularly if there are toys in the pedigree. This is because it is very unlikely that these diseases don't exist in the standards. It's likely such a low incidence that it simply hasn't been noted. Xanthinuria causes painful bladder stones that can be life-threatening if untreated. For both of these diseases, the genetic mutations that cause them are simple recessive with complete penetrance. What does that mean? That means that if your dog has one copy of the gene, it is a carrier and if bred to a clear dog, will not pass on the gene or the disease. It can pass on the gene, so you can produce more carriers, but you will not produce dogs that are affected with the disease. It is important that we keep carriers in our breeding program so we don't lose other valuable genetic material by eradicating those dogs from the gene pool but these carriers must be bred to clear dogs. One of the greatest things about having these tests available is that we no longer have to guess and we can use carriers in our breeding programs. The next genetic screen, and this is the third and final, we only have three genetic tests in our breed, is von Willebrand disease. This is an inherited bleeding disorder resulting from a lack or reduced level of normal blood clotting protein called von Willebrand factor. There are multiple factors that can contribute to a dog's ability to clot. This is one of the less severe of those diseases. There are multiple forms of von Willebrand disease. Type 1 is the form that affects the Manchester Terrier, as it does the Doberman. 
This is a required test for both standards and toys. It is found in both varieties. Anecdotally, it is more often seen in the standard, but there's, it's, there's enough toys that have it that it absolutely warrants testing. The mutation for this disease is dominant with incomplete penetrance in Dobermans and is believed to be the same for our breed. However, there is no specific research done in Manchester Terriers to confirm it at this time. I've actually consulted with multiple geneticists, veterinarians, and OFA itself, and it is believed that this is the case for Manchester. So what does this mean? This means that unlike juvenile dilated cardiomyopathy and xanthinuria, if your dog has two copies of the mutation, it may never have a blood clotting disorder. So it could have two copies of the genetic mutation that causes bleeding, and it may never have a bleeding event. It could also have a severe bleeding event that requires emergency treatment. It's hard to say. Also, with VWD, you, that can be the case if you only have one copy of the genetic mutation. So with cardio and xanthinuria, where it's black and white, it's cut and dry, if you have one copy of the mutation, your dog is never gonna have the disease. It could have a bleeding event if it only has one copy of the mutation. Now this is not going to surprise longtime breeders because anecdotally, I have heard from breeders for, uh, you know, for many years that their carriers bled more during nail trims. This is something that we actually knew within the breed before researchers knew it. Previously, if you're new to the breed, it was believed that VWD was just like cardio and xanthinuria. You needed two copies of the mutation in order to be affected. That has been disproven. According to the UC Davis website, while VWD type 1 can cause serious bleeding problems, it is generally less severe than the other two types of VWD and can be alleviated by treatment. So this disease can present as completely asymptomatic, your dog can never have a bleeding event in its life, or it could spontaneously hemorrhage and have prolonged bleeding from an injury, surgery, or while giving birth. Age of onset can also vary, and it can be something that doesn't occur until later in life. So what does this mean? VWD does not have to be a death sentence. It's just important to be aware of your dog's status, to avoid breedings that could produce dogs that have two copies of the mutation, and to make sure that your vet always knows your dog's VWD status. Now, how do you get these tests done? Where do you get these tests done? It's important to make sure that you are using a genetics lab that is recognized by the OFA. Not all genetic labs are created equally. Not all have the same standards that they follow. I prefer to use GenSol if I only need to test for VWD. If I know the status of my dog's JDCM and xanthinuria testing, and I only need to run the one test. Gensol has the best rate currently on the market. It's $30 for one test. I also have a list on this slide of other labs that are recognized by OFA that you can explore. By the way, VetGen no longer exists, but I copied this right off the OFA website, so they haven't updated it yet. Now, if you were looking to get JDM, JDCM, and Xanthinuria done, you can only do that with one lab, and that is the University of Minnesota Canine Genetics Lab. The reason for that is because they are the ones that we did this research with, and they own the patent on these tests. So no other lab has the ability to run these tests. They must go through the University of Minnesota. You can also bundle that with VWD if you have a dog that needs all three tests, and you can get that done for $130. You can also pay for individual tests if you only need one of these or two of these. If you submit three or more dogs at once, it's $100 for, all, for each of those three dogs to get all three tests, so you can save $90 for those three dogs and, and up if you're submitting more than three dogs. 
They do also offer us the ability to uh, to have discounted pricing if you know we are having a big event like our national specialty. They may give us a discount code that is good for a limited time only and we'll get you the discounted price of $100 for all three tests. Now, I have a panel on here about Embark. And the reason that I have this on here is because I want you to see what a racket this is. The Embark DNA panel costs $159, and they advertise that you can get more than 210 genetic test results for your dog. But you need to understand that the only test that they're actually doing that applies to the Manchester Terrier is VWD. Those other 210 plus genetic tests mean nothing. This is a ploy to make money off of the good faith of breeders who think that they are doing their due diligence by running this test. So many breeders think all they need to do is run an Embark Health DNA panel on their dog, no matter what breed it is, and they have done their health testing and they're good to go. It's a one-stop shop. That is not true. Now, there are some breeds where Embark has the ability to run a panel where you pay $159 and maybe they have five of those 210 tests that apply to the breed. And it really is a discount in that case because you're getting five tests done. Whereas if you go to the, all the different labs that do them, you might cumulatively spend much more. But in the case of the Manchester Terrier, you are being scammed if you are paying specifically to run this panel for your dog's health for breeding purposes. So, Go to Gensol or one of the other recognized labs, not VetGen, um, or, of course, the University of, Canine, of Minnesota Canine Genetics Lab is your only choice for JDCM and Xanthanaria. Our next test is autoimmune thyroiditis. This is the most common cause of primary hypothyroidism in dogs. So with hypothyroidism, the thyroid gland is not making enough of a hormone called thyroxine that controls metabolism. This is the process of turning food into fuel. Hypothyroidism causes a whole variety of symptoms, but is often suspected in dogs that have trouble with weight gain or obesity and suffer from hair loss and skin problems. Untreated thyroid disease is deadly. Your dog can have thyroid disease and not have symptoms. So it is important to do this test. When we talk about hair loss and thyroid disease, we are not talking about the pattern baldness or pattern alopecia that we typically see in the breed where they have thin hair on the backs of the ears, the front of the neck, the chest, and the backs of the legs. Where you see thinness with thyroid disease is generally all over, but specifically on the dog's sides. So along the rib cage, you will see an obvious thinness. So how is this test done? And by the way, this is required for both varieties. This is a blood test that you must send out to a chick approved lab, such as Michigan State. Your primary vet can draw and ship the blood sample with all of the required paperwork for you. There are other labs that are recognized by OFA for this purpose. I prefer Michigan State. If you go to the OFA website, you can look up other options as well. Make sure you confirm pricing with the lab because they are not all priced the same. The minimum age for this test is 12 months. An OFA recommends repeating this test at the ages of two, three, four, six, and eight years of age. And yes, I agree, that is a lot, and that might be overkill. Um, what I do is I will typically do testing every two to three years if I have concerns. Um, this disease has a variable age of onset onset, but it typically will manifest between the ages of two and five years old. A dog can be clinically normal for years and only become hypothyroid at a later date. So it's important to understand the nuances of this disease. 
So if you don't want to do the annual testing, that's fine. Um, but I, however, I do recommend testing your dog after spay and neuter, and you want to wait approximately a year. This is because spaying and neuter, neutering can take a dog that has the potential to become hypothyroid and push them into actually being hypothyroid. I am not saying don't spay or neuter your dogs. The benefits still outweigh the risks. However, um, if when I neuter and spay a dog, I run thyroid testing on them a year later just to be on the safe side. It's also important to know because of the variable age of onset, testing your dog at two years of age is not a good indication of future risk, specifically in our breed, because I typically see this happening in other people's dogs well past the age of two. So what I always do as a breeder and what I recommend to others is to hold off on the thyroid testing if your dog is asymptomatic and do it right before you have planned the breeding. Of course, give yourself enough time to change your plans. If the dog does come back as, as hypothyroid, don't do the test right before you do the breeding. But the longer you wait, the better, and you want to continue to retest every few years. If the dog has been neutered or spayed and is well past the age of 10 and well past that one year of, of you know, from neuter spay date and the dog is normal, I probably wouldn't continue to test unless the dog started to become symptomatic. The marker for autoimmune thyroiditis, thyroid globulin autoantibody formation, usually occurs prior to the occurrence of clinical signs. That is why periodic retesting is recommended. Um, I don't know how accurate this is, but I have read that the disease doesn't show clinical signs until the thyroid gland is 70% destroyed by the disease. That is why it is absolutely so important to make sure that you are testing your breeding dogs for this disease. So the next phenotypic exam is a cardiac evaluation. Now this is required for the standard, but still recommended for the choice. Um, this is a physical exam that must be done by a board certified veterinary cardiologist. You can book this with a cardiology clinic or you can wait until there's a health clinic at a dog show. Um, they, they have these quite often. They're very quick and easy to do. Um, it's not expensive if you're doing the basic cardiac exam, which is the one that is recommended for our breed. Um, it doesn't require anesthesia. And as I said, it's frequently offered at dog shows or health clinics. Um, the recommendation is that this be redone annually and the minimum age for submitting this, having this done and submitting this to OFA check is 12 months. Um, and, and as I said, a basic exam is sufficient if there's no known heart disease noted in recent generations. And um, again, a reminder, there is no cardiac evaluation to diagnose JDCM. This test, no version, advanced or basic, will tell you if your dog has JDCM, you must do the genetic test. So there are different exams that you can do to be covered for a cardiac evaluation. Um, the basic cardiac exam is a simple auscultation. That is where the cardiologist um, listens to the heart valves uh, and does a much more thorough exam than a regular vet. So it, it kind of looks like when your vet listens to the dog's heart during a routine physical, but it's a person who is specially trained to listen to each of the heart valves and understand what it sounds like if there is an abnormality present. Um, by, detect, by checking puppies, you can detect problems and eliminate a dog from your breeding program and avoid spending money on a show career or additional health tests. Adult dogs that develop heart disease may or may not have an inherited problem, but probably need additional diagnostics or treatment. So what I tell people is if you have no history of heart disease in your breeding program and you know that you've been 
the dogs have been tested for many, many generations and you have proof of that, a basic exam is sufficient unless the, when that exam, examination is done, a murmur, an abnormality is found, then you will be recommended to get further testing done and you could do an advanced exam. You could go to uh, make an appointment with a cardiologist, whatever it is that the examining veterinarian recommends. Of course, if you want to do an echocardiogram, you know, some breeds also require Holter monitoring. You're free to do so, um, but I, in my opinion, it's often unnecessary. Our next phenotypic exam is the ACVOI exam. This used to be called SURF. SURF was a foundation that was created around the time that the OFA was created and OFA only did orthopedic evaluations and SURF only did eyes, but SURF has since closed and that testing protocol has now been adopted by OFA. This is a required exam for the standard Manchester Terrier. It is a physical exam by a board certified veterinary ophthalmologist. So, the minimum age for this, there's actually no minimum age for this. You can have this done at any age, but it is recommended that you have the dog re-examined annually. This is required by Chick. Um, and just breed specific notes here, we have seen persistent pupillary membranes and juvenile cataracts in the breed. So when you get the test done, you, you will get breeding advice based on the disease, if the disease, a disease is identified and what the breed is. If your dog is clear, there are no abnormalities found. Your dog is free currently of the eye disease that can be examined for with a physical exam. Um, you may get a breeder option, which means that there is something in the eye that shouldn't be there and it's suspected to be in inherited, but maybe it doesn't compromise the vision or other function of the eye. In that case, it's considered the breeder's option whether to breed that dog or not. And then a no, so they advise you not to breed a dog if there is substantial evidence that the abnormality found is inherited or if it represents a potential compromise to the vision or ocular function of the dog. So this is an example in this photo of a dog with persistent pupillary membranes. There's three kinds of this. There's iris to iris, iris to lens, iris to cornea. PPMs absolutely exist in the breed in all three forms. They are caused by a failure of an embryonic structure to degrade. They are congenital, so they're present from birth. You can have your puppies examined for this at eight weeks if you'd like. Iris to iris is considered benign doesn't affect the vision of, of the dog's eyes, and in my opinion, is fine to breed. Uh, but the other two can cause cataracts and damage to the cornea, both of which, which can result in vision loss. And they are considered inherited. This is obviously not a Manchester, but it's a good photograph uh, to show you what it looks like. Because you can see how they're doing damage to the cornea in this photo. Juvenile cataracts generally develop between six months and six years of age, and they are inherited. A dog can easily be clear on its first exam and then develop these heritable cataracts later on, which is why it's important to have these exams yearly. They may or may not cause blindness depending on how they progress. While cataracts in young animals can also be caused by injury, unless there is significant trauma to the eye, it's best to assume that cataracts presenting in dogs less than six years are heritable and remove that dog from the breeding program. It takes significant injury to cause a cataract by injury. So it's not something simple like, oh, he, he got jostled around in the crate and hit his eye. It must be quite significant. So in, in most cases, cataracts or juvenile cataracts are going to be hereditary. And it is something that is in the breed. The next phenotypic evaluation um, is leg calves herthes disease. This is a required test for the Manchester, the toy Manchester variety. However, it has also been seen in standards. 
This is believed to be genetic. However, the mutation is unknown at this time. And it is believed by some that expression of the disease may be dependent on environmental factors. But there's no definitive ruling on that. More research is certainly needed and is being done because this does affect many small breeds. So what is legs calves perthes disease? This is a disease that occurs when the blood supply to the femoral head is interrupted. So this is the femoral head. Fits in the socket, ball socket, right? Ball socket joint. We don't know why the femoral head blood supply gets interrupted, but it at some point it does, and it results in a vascular necrosis, which is death of the bone cells in the femoral head. This is followed by a period of revascularization, and the femoral head is subject to remodeling or and collapse, which creates an irregular fit in the acetabellum or socket. So what happens is the hip is the hip starts to disintegrate or deteriorate. This is an example of a hip with perthes. And you can see here that there's a fine line through here. This is a break in the femoral head. As you can assume, this is excruciatingly painful for the dog. In fact, it's so painful that when you give the dogs the proper surgery to treat this, they're up and moving much faster than you would ever believe. Um, so, the treatment for this is to remove this femoral head. So you remove the femoral head, the, the femur sits here just as it would, and you do physical therapy to remodel the musculature in the rear end that's in this area. The mus musculature supports the, fem the end of the femur here, creates what's called a false joint, and your dog can have a normal active life. Here's an example of another hip, another view of a one side has legs perthes and one side does not, although this is a poor hip still. Um, so if you don't have the surgery or any treatment done and you allow the femoral head to remodel, it may never fracture and it may remodel on its own um, and have, have a, a new femoral head in place on its own. However, uh, this will lead to severe stiffness, pain, osteoarthritis, and eventually you will probably need to still have the surgery done because the dog will be in so much pain from the osteoarthritis. So it's always best to um, to be on the lookout for this disease and treat it as soon as possible. So this is a required test for the toy. It is not required for the standard, but I do recommend it as it has been seen in standards. Uh, this is a test that is done by radiograph. Your vet can do these radiographs, but your vet must be trained in how to do these radiographs for OFA. So you'll want to check with your vet, and if they're not, you'll have to find a vet who is trained, talk to other breeders in your area, uh, look for clinics. These radiographs are submitted to OFA for evaluation by a board-certified radiologist. The minimum age for this is 12 months. Uh, the onset for this disease is typically between 9 and 18 months of age, but you're more often going to see it prior to 12 months of age. Um, this is a one-time test, so you can test your dog anytime after the age of 12 months with an x-ray, um, and, and it's definitive. Your dog has legs perthes or doesn't have legs perthes. Um, if it's an older dog that's had legs perthes and has had the remodeling and wasn't treated, it could present as hip dysplasia. Again, doesn't matter if it was caused by legs perthes or not, a dog with hip dysplasia should not be bred. But I have seen that happen. Where a dog was not treated, it was not known that the dog had legs perthes and it later was diagnosed with hip dysplasia. Um, this is, again, something that really does exist in both varieties. Don't let people tell you otherwise. Radiographs are the only way to know, and I say this because affected dogs can be asymptomatic and develop arthritis at a later age. This, these are the cases that I was talking about that can turn into hip dysplasia later. Um, studies have been done on, on breeds affected by legs perthes where they have x-rayed older dogs, and they were never tested for legs perthes, and their radiographs showed remodeling 
later in life that went completely undetected at the time when the dog was going through it. Um, and then I always, always, always encourage breeders to inform their puppy buyers that there is a risk for this disease in the breed and strongly encourage them to purchase health insurance because the surgery and the rehab is so expensive. Um, you know, if I have somebody who is really against health insurance, I tell them, look, just get it for the first year. After the dog turns a year old, have your vet take a quick x-ray of the hips. Most vets can read these x-rays right there and tell you if the dog has legs perthes or not. And then if they say no, you can go and cancel your health insurance. Now, if you're a breeder, you need to go through it the right way and have it done and the, by a vet that does proper radiographs and submit it to OFA. But if you're just a, a pet owner who wants to know, you can have it done at your vet office. Your vet can read them and tell you yes or no. If your dog has it, you're going to be really happy that the dog is insured. They can't just have surgery. Many vets will tell you that this can only be that this only needs a quick surgery. It's not the case. You, they need physical rehab. They need to have a specific kind of physical therapy done to help them with creating that false joint in the muscle that I talked about earlier. That does not happen on its own, and it can be very painful if that does not occur. Patellar luxation. So this is done by physical exam by your primary care veterinarian. Any veterinarian can do this exam. They get trained in this in vet school. This is a common issue in small breeds. The minimum age for this is 12 months. For re-examination, the chick guidelines only say periodically. Um, while we do see this in both varieties, it's definitely more frequently found in toys. Puppies can be affected as young as eight weeks old. Uh, if you see an eight week old puppy that has patellar luxation, it's typically going to be grade three or four, which is the highest. So they're, they're graded as grades one through four. Grade one and two can be difficult to detect. Um, it may not become evident until middle age or until the dog has developed joint disease as a result of the luxation. And dogs with grade one to two luxation typically do not require surgery, but three to four does. Um, we occasionally see dogs in the show ring that miss a step or skip here and there, and they're unable to tell why the dog does this. The, the vet does an exam and can't find anything wrong with the dog. Um, it is possible that that dog has a very mild grade one luxation. It can be caused by injury, absolutely. I do not encourage my dogs to bounce up and down. I discourage that from a very young age so that they don't get in the habit of bouncing up and down because I do feel that this is bad for their knees and their hips. Our last test is congenital deafness. Um, this is recommended for standards as it is known to appear and pop up in standards from time to time. This needs to be done by a board certified veterinary neurologist. You can book an appointment with a neurologist or you can go to a health clinic. The puppy must be at least 35 days old, so this can be done at a very young age. Here's an example of a, of a bull terrier puppy getting this done. Um, this is done via brain stem auditory evoked response, which is why it's called Bayer testing. Um, it is the only acceptable method of, of testing to see if a dog has reduced hearing or hearing loss. It is also the only way that you can detect unilateral deafness. This would be a dog that is deaf in one ear. Your, your regular vet cannot look at your dog and tell you if the dog has hearing difficulties or is deaf in one ear. They probably can only ever tell you if the dog is completely deaf and there are various forms of deafness, so that is not adequate. Um, congenital deafness in dogs, so from birth, can be acquired. It can be caused by infections in the uterus, certain kinds of drugs, um, medications, liver problems, toxic, toxic exposures, but it can also be inherited. I myself will say that I have tested noise sensitive toys in my breeding program because I have read that noise sensitivity can be a sign of unilateral deafness. 
Um, however, I do not routinely have this test done on my own breeding stock. Those dogs that I tested had full hearing, um, but I did not see the need to continue testing for it once I determined that it wasn't in my lines. Um, it's very low risk for toys. Uh, and then another thing to mention is that this tests whether or not they can hear in each year. It does not test the quality of their hearing. So that's it for health testing basics and recommendation. Our next topic that we're going to talk about, and this is a short topic, is breed research. So we are currently um, doing uh, our best to, f to get DNA samples to the University of Minnesota Canine Genetics Lab. This is the lab that we worked with to develop the test for JDCM and xanthinuria because we are studying protein losing diseases in Manchester Terriers. Uh, the two most common protein losing diseases found in our breed are protein losing enteropathy and protein losing nephropathy. These are umbrella terms that refer to conditions of the gastrointestinal tract in the case of enteropathy and the kidney in the case of nephropathy that results, results in a loss of protein from the body. These are deadly diseases. They can occur at any time in life. Um, this is in a family of immune-related diseases, which includes, among other things, intestinal lymphangiectasia, inflammatory bowel disease, familial glomerulopathy, amyloidosis, and some forms of glomerulonephritis. I don't know if I said those right. Sorry if I butchered those. Um, the point here is that um, these diseases are growing within the breed. And a lot of us are very concerned about the future of the breed if something is not done. However, we cannot do the research that is needed without DNA samples from dogs who are affected with these diseases. It is vital and critical that if you have a dog, have produced a dog, or know someone with a dog that is affected by any of these diseases, that we get DNA samples that we can store with the University of Minnesota. Once we have stored enough samples, they can start the process of looking for the gene. If we can find the genetic mutation that causes these diseases, we can develop a test. If you have any questions about this study, you can reach out to the university directly. The information's on the slide, or you can reach out to me directly. My email is michelle at maximaldog.com. Our last slide here is a list of web links that I think would be helpful. So um, there's two places where you can go to find health clinics that offer the phenotypic evaluations that we discussed in this program. One is the OFA website. They have a listing of health clinics. Uh, one of my favorite, most comprehensive websites is a Cavalier Health website called www.cavalierhealth.org. It's for Cavalier King Charles Spaniels, but they realize that it is used by all breeds and it is just the most accurate listing and up-to-date listing of health testing around the country. Of course, the OFA website is OFA.org. I also have the link here for the the Uni University of Minnesota Canine Genetics Lab and Genzel. Um, and if you go to the Canadian Manchester Terrier website, you can see the, the information about the PLN PLE study that I just discussed. Um, www.canadamt.com slash ple.html. And again, if you have any questions, you can always reach out to the University of Minnesota about the PLE PLN research, anything else reach out to me. And I hope you enjoyed this presentation. Thank you for taking the time to learn a little bit more about health testing and the Manchester Terrier.